I was thinking about this idea of these, all these young people, a sea of young people in Dadaab who are all on social media. And what does it mean for someone who has the longing to be elsewhere? You know, no one feels, the government, the Kenyans don't want them there. Uh, they can't go home because there's a war. They can't work. And yet, they are connected to all of our privileges we take for granted. I wonder what that does to one's heart, one's, one's mm. soul. How, how do you, I mean, for me, that's tragic. That's exactly, that's one of the questions I wanted to explore with the book. That was one of, exactly one of the things that I found so fascinating about Dadaab is that there is a, there is a kind of character being produced in this, in this strange culture. Um, and it's a character that has m many, many different aspects, which are both a product of our, our modern situation, um, as well as um, sort of casualties of it as well. And you have young people like Tawane who, you know, all the time, their daily life is lived in the shadow of, of this, this idea of A, what could have been, and B, what should have been. Um, the, the life that he wants to have and the life that he could have avoided. And he's negotiating in this sort of limbo all the time um, and, and in, in a sense, manufacturing hope. Every morning you're manufacturing hope. You've got to find a different reason to, to carry on. So I had the very strange experience of interviewing people um, and one day, you, you, like, there's a young woman, Cairo, in the book who... Want, who uh, initially, when I first met her, she wanted to get a scholarship to Canada because that's one of the few legal routes out, along with the resettlement lottery, is if you become, if you get in the top ten in the secondary school in the camp, and there's two and a half thousand secondary school students, and there should be triple that, but of those number, the top ten go to uh, get scholarships to Canada. And she spent her whole life wanting to go to Canada. And then when that didn't happen because she didn't make the cut, she then became a teacher in the camp. And for a long time, she still talked about going to Canada, mm. even though that was not an option for her. And then there was another short, after a while that that died down, and I would ask her, well, what now? And she said, well, I'm, I'm going to go to university in Kenya, and then I'm going to be a medic. And then a few next day it was, well, no, I'm, I'm actually I'm going to be an accountant, and I'm going to do this. And then it was... And then the next day you talk to her and say, oh, well, it's all not true, nothing's working, I'm just going to get married. Yeah. You know, every day is a different future that she's imagining for herself. And the same with all the other people, that their, their sense of self is so unstable. So you have these, you're creating, the, the camp is creating these selves who are very, very uh, fragile um, and susceptible to all kinds of pressures, which to some extent, you know, might be true for you know, young people growing up in other parts of the world as well, but it, they are so vulnerable to, to social media in a way that, you know, perhaps even more so than, than and I don't have teenage children, but when they grow up, I'm sure I'll <laughs> encounter those problems. But, you know, I'm sure there are parallels there, but in the, in the camp, it's extreme. Yeah, because the dream is equal. The access isn't. Exactly. So that's, that's where it gets to be very uh, dangerous in a way, because there we are connected in a way that exposes uh, all of the things that we you know. We're on Instagram, we, th we have the perfect life because it's angled this way and, and all of this. And so, but th they see that, they watch that, you know, they, they're on those social media and they also want to do it, but they can't lift a finger toward that future. It's all by chance or something, unless you're a Cairo who's trying to do... Yeah. You know. Have you see, come across this phenomenon? I mean, in the, in the... I don't talk about it in the book because I only found out about it afterwards, but several of the people um, who are on Facebook, and we're now, obviously, we're still in touch, we're still friends, and we chat all the time, but some of their profiles now, I've noticed, are conveniently constructed. So I found out that Guled is actually from Cincinnati, Ohio. Is he? Uh, and he was recently in Paris. Yes. And there's a photo of him photoshopped on the body of Wayne Rooney making a fantastic goal for Manchester United. <laughs> but 
And some of his friends are doing similar things. They're constructing these images. They're laying claim to these images that they can't access. Um, they can get the images, but they can't get the experiences. Yeah. And they're pasting, cutting and pasting these lives. I suppose to some extent we all do that with social media, but they're doing it in, a, in an extreme way. Yeah. I, get, I get messages sometimes from young people who I'm pretty sure are either in Kenya or at one of these camps. And uh, they, you know, but, so they're surprised if I write back or something and I'll say, hello, uh, you know, how are you, you know, just normal questions and then, uh, but I always ask, you know, where are you? Because I'm just curious as to where this person is writing me from. Almost always they tell you the, that they are the place that they dream to be. Mm. You know, because, uh, and then you see that, you see the interact, because the person is speaking, writing to me in English insistently. It's funny, because I would write in Somali. And because they insist on dreaming that way, they'll write you in English. But I can see they don't have the English to claim where they live. Yeah. 